quick note before we begin. This episode contains adult language. We've used voice actors to bring you the words spoken in court. On Monday afternoon, lawyers for long-awaited witness Fiona Brown argued giving evidence in the defamation proceedings would harm her mental health. But Justice Michael Lee said she must step into the box. Brown was chief of staff to former Senator Linda Reynolds when Brittany Higgins alleges she was raped by Bruce Lehrman. Higgins alleged in the project interview and in court, Brown and Reynolds engaged in a cover-up of the alleged assault. Brown rejected those allegations in an interview with The Australian in June. Justice Michael Lee said the medical evidence was quite compelling, but ultimately ordered Brown to appear in a court closed to everyone except legal counsel and media. Brittany Higgins claims she was raped on a sofa in Minister Reynolds' office on March 23, 2019. In the following days, Brown said all she knew was that there'd been a security incident. Higgins and fellow young staffer Bruce Lehrman came into the office after 1am. Brown said she was told Higgins had been found naked on a sofa, that an ambulance had been offered, and that Higgins had declined. Brown said she was deeply shocked and called them both in for explanations. Under cross-examination, Brown said she suspected Lehrman had returned to the office to look at files. She said she was puzzled when Lehrman told her he'd come in to drink whiskey. When Justice Michael Lee asked if she thought Lehrman was not being candid, Brown said, my antenna was up. The judge said to Brown, you knew their age, you knew they came back intoxicated, you understood they had been drinking whiskey, you knew she had been found naked. Putting those things together, did you think it was more likely than not they had sex? Brown replied, I wouldn't say it was more likely than not. It was possible. Brown said Lehrman told her Higgins was fine when he left the office. Brown said on Tuesday, March 26, Higgins told her she woke up semi-naked on the sofa, but said she did not suspect Higgins had been assaulted. Brown said, I didn't think she'd been assaulted. I thought she would have told me. Brown said two days later, she met with Higgins again. Here's what Brown said. She pivoted. She was quite casual. She just said, out of the blue, I remember him on top of me. I was shocked by that. Brown said she was upset when the project's producer, Angus Llewellyn, contacted her via text message in mid-February 2021. She said she sent some information about the alleged assault to Andrew Carswell, a media advisor in the Prime Minister's office shortly after, and was not consulted on the statement he sent the project, which they published online. Brown said, I was very traumatised. Earlier on Monday, the court heard from a handful of other witnesses. Here's what they had to say. Brittany Higgins was a real go-getter who changed after she claimed she was raped by Bruce Lehrman. That's the testimony of Sam O'Connor, a friend of Higgins and a former staffer from Canberra, who's now the member for Bonnie in the Queensland Parliament. O'Connor is 32 and met Higgins when he was working for Federal MP Stuart Robert. On March 29, 2019, six days after her alleged rape, Higgins sent O'Connor a message. We've used voice actors to bring you the words in evidence. Team Reynolds has been a somewhat controversial topic in the federal scene as late. I'm intrigued. Trust me, it's best left alone, haha. If you hear anything particularly pointed, though, you know where to direct it to. In a phone call on April 19, about three weeks after the alleged rape, Higgins sent O'Connor a message. Sorry, I'm just over it. This super fucked up thing happened a little while ago and I've just lost the fire. They spoke by phone and O'Connor told the court this. She talked about another staffer who, I didn't know his name at the time, but she mentioned that he'd worked for George Brandis and that he was from Toowoomba. I remember that being in the conversation, but she told me that he had taken her back to Parliament House and that he had raped her. I absolutely remember the word rape. It's not something you forget. And she absolutely did say that he had taken her back to Parliament House under the guise of having to drop in there or something. And I remember, because I had previously been a Federal MP staffer, I remember thinking how unusual that was at that particular time on an early Saturday morning. 
I think in subsequent conversations, we talked about her reporting it to the police. And I don't recall whether she had told me that she had. But she was certainly concerned about the implications of that. At the time, Higgins was working in Western Australia on the election campaign. Earlier in evidence, Higgins told the court she really wanted to go home to Queensland, but she said Linda Reynolds' chief of staff, Fiona Brown, had told her she could either go to Queensland and effectively leave politics or go to WA and continue to be employed. This is what Higgins told the court on November 29. So the conversations with Fiona started getting more and more tense. It suddenly became about the election. Fiona Brown was starting to ask me about the election. She used words to the effect of, during the election, where would you want to be? You can go to WA or you can go home to the Gold Coast. And I said, well, I'd obviously want to be near my family. That would be great. And she said, well, they would just pay me out to go to the Gold Coast, but I wouldn't be working. And I said, OK, well, that would be fine. But how would I come back? And she said, well, you wouldn't. And so for me, that was like a pivotal conversation because it became really clear because things were getting more tense that I either go to WA and I continue with the team or I would be paid out and I could just go home. But on Monday, in his evidence, Sam O'Connor said Higgins told him she felt she'd been sidelined by being sent to Western Australia. She felt like she was sort of being punted over there. How she felt she was away from the action and it touched on some of the contacts she was having from the PMO at that time as well. She felt that she was away from the action in Canberra. She felt that there was a desire to to make sure that she didn't go public with this story, particularly in the lead-up to the election, that people were checking in on her. Asked who was checking in, O'Connor named one of the most powerful people in government, Scott Morrison's Principal Private Secretary, Euron Finkelstein. The name that really stuck with me was Euron which I knew to be Yaron Finkelstein, who was a senior staffer in the PMO. And it would just be sort of seeing how she was going. Nothing specific, but she very much viewed it as keeping her in the tent. That was how she perceived it. That was unusual from my perspective, to have someone so senior checking in with a relatively junior staffer. In a recorded pre-interview conversation, which has been played to the court, Higgins told the project this about the time of the airing of a 2020 episode of Four Corners, focusing on unproven allegations against former Attorney General Christian Porter. So I had a call from this guy, Yaron Finkelstein. So we've only professionally, inside of my work capacity, probably interacted two or three times. Like, he does not need to know my name. I'm quite low on the pecking order compared to Yaron. Yeah, and so, yeah, he called me out of the blue on the Four Corners week because I was out sick and I knew what the conversation was about. He knew what the conversation was about. And it was broadly just a check-in and mechanism of like, I don't know, I don't, it was, it was more just, are you okay? The day after the project's interview aired, Scott Morrison denied this phone call by Finkelstein had happened at all. When Higgins was working for Senator Michaelia Cash after the election, O'Connor said she was worried about the alleged rape being mentioned in public. I remember one particular conversation on the day of the hearing where she had talked about a press conference being a diversion for the minister, answering questions about it or being asked about it. There was a journalist or something asking questions and she was concerned about it becoming public. And at that point, that was the last thing that Brittany wanted for this to become public. In early 2021, Higgins told O'Connor she was giving interviews on the topic. I absolutely remember her desire for some sort of change to the culture around Parliament. That had been an ongoing sort of topic of conversation. And this was sort of, in her mind, the next step in achieving that. But I do remember thinking it was unusual because every single conversation we had had up until that point was about her not wanting this to be public and about her going to great lengths to prevent this from becoming public. Earlier in the trial, Higgins said she'd been inspired by Four Corners' original Christian Porter episode. In March 2021, Four Corners did another story called Bursting the Canberra Bubble. Higgins told O'Connor she'd been involved behind the scenes with Four Corners' second episode. Higgins also said she'd been staying with Lisa Wilkinson and her husband. I feel okay. I worked with Four Corners behind the scenes to help piece it all together. I've been staying with Lisa W and Peter Fitzsimons in Sydney for the past few days. They've been so wonderful. 
The court earlier heard evidence Fitzsimons helped negotiate a book deal for Higgins. O'Connor said Higgins changed after the alleged rape from having been a real go-getter. She was a bit testier. We'd sometimes have arguments over small things. Something had absolutely changed, and it was more visible in person on those few occasions that I spoke to her. But there was absolutely a change in her demeanour after that point. Veteran TV producer Peter Meekin has ruled the newsrooms of every major commercial TV network in Australia since the 70s, and he's a famously shrewd operator. In 2021, he was an executive consultant to TEN's News and Current Affairs division, and he was closely involved in overseeing the production of the project's Brittany Higgins story. He's giving evidence for TEN, telling the court he left most of the operational details of the story to producer Angus Llewellyn and the team. Meekin sent an email to Llewellyn on February 3, 2021. I plan to advise that it's a little early to itemise the approaches, but we won't be making them without the approval of Brittany. And in the case of the political figures, it won't be until much closer to the transmission date. Matthew Richardson, counsel for Bruce Lehrman, asked this. Was it true, Mr Meakin, that you wouldn't be making approaches without the approval of Ms Higgins? That's what it says, but at least advising her that we were doing it. Well, you talk about we won't be making them without the approval of Brittany. That's the language you used, isn't it? That is the language I use. Is that actually true? Well, it's, it was certainly my intention. And it was my intention that we keep her advised as part of our duty of care to her. I want to suggest to you, Mr Meekin, that it was not appropriate for Ms Higgins as a complainant or source to be dictating who the project approached for interviews. I would agree with that, and I don't think she did. Richardson read Meekin an email he'd sent on 13 February 2021, two days before the story aired. It was in response to a message from Lisa Wilkinson showing a photo of herself and Llewellyn outside federal parliament with the words... Mission complete. Not just yet. We have still to see how the pigeons react. Meekin said this was a jocular way to refer to the ministers. Sounds like a bit of a game, doesn't it? No, I've sometimes used jocular language, but I can assure you it wasn't a game. On the Sunday before publication, Angus Llewellyn forwarded an email from the PM's media advisor, Andrew Carswell, which said Linda Reynolds had told Higgins she'd be supported and there'd be no impact on her career, encouraged her to go to the police and had her office facilitate the first contact with police. Do you disbelieve any of that? I didn't believe or disbelieve it. I accepted it as the government's position. Did you understand on a broad sense that Ms Higgins' narrative was she was told she wouldn't have a job if she pursued a police complaint? Yes. Did it occur to you when you read the email that it was possible that narrative might not be accurate? I realised it was being challenged, yes. Did you think that at that point it was important for someone to go back and talk to Ms Higgins again? That didn't occur to me, no. We'd already done the interview, no, and I don't think there was much prospect of doing another one. Did you suggest to Mr Llewellyn or anyone else that they speak to Ms Higgins? I can't recall. You agree that when you read this statement, your understanding was that it did not corroborate what she was saying? I would accept that, yes. Coming up, why Peter Meekin says the project didn't always heed his advice. In court on Monday, Bruce Lehrman's senior counsel, Matthew Richardson, took Meekin to two documents Scott Morrison's press secretary, Andrew Carswell, provided to the project in defence of Fiona Brown and the government. One was an email from Lauren Barrons, a senior bureaucrat in the Office of Ministerial and Parliamentary Services in the Department of Finance, which provided human resources support to government. It's dated March 29, 2019, six days after the alleged rape 
and included notes of a conversation with Fiona Brown. Here's what Lauren Barrons wrote in the email to Brown about a conversation they'd had. Should she choose to, she's able to pursue a complaint, including a complaint made to the police, and that to do so would be within her rights. You have made it very clear to her that if she requires assistance in making a complaint, you would be willing to support her. In addition, I understand you have discussed with her on several occasions that if she does choose to pursue a complaint, even at a later date, she would have the full and ongoing support of yourself and the Minister. Matthew Richardson asked Peter Meakin about this. Now, did you believe when you read that, that it was consistent with what Ms Higgins was saying? To be honest, Mr Richardson, I don't even know that I read this one. If I did read it, I don't recall it. Well, I suggest it's a pretty significant email, isn't it? Because it's contemporaneous and it records on the 29th of March what someone in an HR capacity was confirming had happened to Ms Brown. Yep. If you had read the email, you'd agree with me, wouldn't you? That the first, that it would have been obviously important to go and check this account with Ms Higgins. It certainly tells a different narrative, yes. The judge asked if that meant the answer to the question, it was important to check the account with Ms Higgins, was yes. I think it would have been desirable, yes. The other document Carswell sent Llewellyn was a text message exchange between Brittany Higgins and Fiona Brown that went like this. All the best with your new gig. Thank you. I wanted to say this in person, but I cannot overstate how much I value your support and advice throughout this period. You've been absolutely incredible and I'm so appreciative. Thanks, Brittany. Fiona Brown attached an image of a bottle of champagne. Here's what Matthew Richardson wanted to know. And of course you would agree, wouldn't you, that this was quite different to the manner in which Ms Higgins had depicted Ms Brown to the project. Yes, it's inconsistent. I agree. For instance, you were aware that in the program, Ms Higgins alleges Fiona Brown had said, well, you wouldn't, when Ms Higgins asked her if she would be able to come back to her job from going home. You remember that? Yes, I do. When you read this SMS, did you think it was worth going back to Ms Higgins to check what she had alleged about Ms Brown? Well, I don't recall advising anyone to do it. In retrospect, did you think it would have been a good idea? Well... It wouldn't have done any harm. Did you think, Mr Meakin, that it might have been relevant to check with Ms Higgins whether she had any other messages passing between her and Ms Brown? Well, I suppose in retrospect that we could have done a lot of things, but I think, I think, we, I, I think Angus did a good job. Matthew Richardson kept pushing. Now, after you received Mr Llewellyn's email and the email from Mr Carswell, you knew that the government's position was that the minister had told Ms Higgins there would be no impact on her career, correct? I didn't know that they told her that. I knew that they were contending that, yes. And some of that information came from that background, which, you know, is not the most reliable source of information in my view. On the morning of the broadcast, Llewellyn sent Meakin an email in which he said... When he spoke to me on background, he said that she was offered support frequently and implied it was there on offer in WA. He said that it was her choice to go to WA and there was never any question over her employment. Can't quote him on that, though. Richardson asked if it had occurred to Meakin that it might be important to go back to Higgins and check some of it. Uh, no, it didn't. Richardson also suggested the project had misled the audience about the availability of the Parliament House CCTV footage from the night of the alleged assault. What the project is doing here is to say there's some good news for Brittany tonight. After almost two years, Parliament House authorities have finally told us the CCTV will be available to investigators. And those words, aren't they, are purporting to summarise what Parliament House authorities had said. I don't recall the actual events here, but I think there was some delay in getting to that position. We were under a misunderstanding as to the availability of the footage. You see, what I want to say to you, and I accept the word finally wasn't yours, but I want to suggest the words Parliament House authorities have finally told us the CCTV will be available to investigators is misleading. I don't know that it's misleading, sir. 
In an email to Angus Llewellyn and other producers on February 10, Peter Meakin advised the project to ask Minister Michaelia Cash for an interview, along with Senator Linda Reynolds and the police. The project didn't request an interview with Cash. And do you know why that happened? Why she wasn't asked for the interview? Well, all I can assume is that they didn't take my advice. It wouldn't be the first time that happened. Right at the end of his evidence, Meakin was asked about Lisa Wilkinson's final line in the project episode, in which she said, We of course approached all the people named in our story, and all of our requests for interviews were declined. In her evidence, Lisa Wilkinson quibbled over this point. First, she said she understood everyone had been approached, including Minister Cash. She also said it wasn't supposed to include Bruce Lamon because he hadn't been named in the story. Remember, Lamon had not responded to any requests and says he didn't see any communications from the project until after the episode aired. Here's what Wilkinson said in her evidence on Friday under cross-examination by Matthew Richardson. I believe if we had singled out Mr Lamon and said that we approached the alleged perpetrator and he didn't get back to us, that would reflect in a more negative way on Mr Lehrman. But I'm suggesting in a broad sense that that's exactly the impression that was given. Do you agree or disagree? I disagree. Here's what Matthew Richardson asked Peter Meakin on Monday. I want to suggest that you understood that that was intended to cover and refer to Mr Lerman. Yes, it was intended to refer to him, even though he wasn't named in the story. And yes, that's a point I acknowledge grammatically. Your Honour, that is the cross-examination. The judge told Meakin he was excused. Thanks for joining us on The Front. The trial continues and you can follow live updates all day at theaustralian.com.au.